You cannot judge an MMO game until you've played at least 100 hours. This statement is wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Drive Hayes, and a comment that I get a lot on all of my YouTube videos is you haven't played this game long enough to judge it. Now, I've been analysing video games on YouTube for several years now, specialising in the massively multiplayer online genre, or MMO. I've spent tens of thousands of collective hours inside virtual worlds. On this channel, we've played the best and the worst. We've analysed all the design choices of everything in between, but one of the biggest issues I face with being so varied in the games I critique is... I cannot dedicate a large amount of time to every single game. Which often leads to people in the comments, or Discord, or sometimes even Twitter messaging me and explaining that my opinion on any game that I don't have at least a thousand hours in is worthless because they've played more than me. Which actually led me to ask a very interesting question. How long do you need to play an MMO, or video game in general, for before you can make a somewhat accurate assessment of the overall quality of the game and decide if it either is the game for you or a game you'd happily recommend to other people? How much time do you need to put into a game before you have gathered enough knowledge to make an objective review of its overall quality? A thousand hours? Five hundred? A solid month of play? How about one hour? I believe if you know what you're looking for, and you know how to spot the signs of a good or bad game, you can form a very accurate viewpoint within only one hour of gameplay. And in this video, I'll share with you the tips and tricks to help you do just that. You might want to grab a drink, because this video gets quite analytical. Before we begin, please consider dropping a like on the video or subscribing to the channel for more MMO stuff and ringing the bell so you don't miss a single future video. And a huge thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Twitch who make all my content possible. Right, let's begin. First of all, don't worry, I can hear some of you screaming, there's no way you can experience everything a game has in one hour, and you are completely correct. There is indeed no way to experience the entirety of a game in one hour, especially an MMO game, which as we know is a genre specialising in lasting hundreds if not thousands of hours, but I'm not talking about experiencing everything the game has to offer. I'm talking about gathering enough information from the game to build up a picture of the overall quality to assess what the game values, the themes it will explore and the mechanics it has chosen to refine. One hour is not enough time to experience the entire game, that's true, but it is enough time to judge it if you know what you're looking for. Let's start with some examples outside of the MMO world, things we'll all be familiar with, and I'll show you how we're looking for general signs of quality, both positive and negative, to form a valid opinion. Everyone can have an opinion on things. To have an analytically valid objective opinion, however, requires specialist knowledge of that thing. You need to be considered an expert to understand the inner workings of it and why decisions have been made. Now, we gather this knowledge as humans through experience. In a similar fashion, you actually have this knowledge without even realising it. You don't need to eat every item on the menu at a restaurant to know if it's a good restaurant, or watch every episode of a TV show to know if it's a good show. You can often make a rather accurate overall assessment of a thing with somewhat limited experience of it if you know what it values, providing you have knowledge of the broad subject in general and lots of past experiences to compare it to. There's actually a psychological field of study, and this is my specialty, known as phenomenology, which we'll be referring to heavily in this hour's assessment. Put simply, phenomenology is the study of the entire experience by analysing every small part which adds up to a whole. It allows you to judge the overall quality of an output of anything from knowing only a few smaller inputs, provided you have the skills to know what inputs to look for. Let's get to grips with this style of time-limited research using an example we can all understand. Going to a restaurant. Imagine a new restaurant has opened up in town and you've decided to visit. How many items from the menu do you need to eat before you can give the restaurant an honest critique and share your opinion with your friends and have it be valid? All of them? Well, no. Not all of them. When you arrive at the restaurant, 
How does the building look? Is it crumbling and dirty and smelly, or has it been cleaned up and does it look nice from the outside? When you open the front door, is it hanging off its hinges and damaged, or does it swing open nicely? Is there music playing in the background? Is the music the right volume, or can you just hear the ambient sound of chefs screaming at each other? Is the floor swept and clean or sticky and stained? Does the waiter greet you with a professional hello and a tidy uniform, or are all the staff stood around in their own clothes on their phone? Is the menu vast and varied and spread too thin, or does this place specialise in just a few high-quality things? Are the customer toilets clean and well-kept, or dirty and horrible? After you've ordered, how long does your food take to get to you? And when it arrives, is it hot? Is it cold? Does it look well presented? All these factors play a major part in the overall quality of the restaurant, and we've not even eaten the food yet. We've not experienced the core part that we were there for, and yet we already have a vast amount of data and knowledge about this restaurant's overall quality. Because every small aspect we've seen is something that the restaurant is in full control of, and how they choose to present it to us tells us so much about the level of quality we can expect and what they value. If everything we've experienced up to this point of the food arriving has been high-quality, cared-for situations, it's likely the food will be too. If everything so far has been a low-quality, overlooked situation, it's likely the food will be the same. This is phenomenology. How about this example? Imagine you are in a room with two other people. Both of them are musicians, and you are about to decide which of them gets a very big job. They both play the same instrument, let's say a guitar. Now, you don't need to be an expert on the guitar for this to work. If you are an expert, you'll be able to judge this quicker. If you aren't an expert, you'll still be able to judge this. It'll just take you a little bit longer to notice the important factors. Of these two musicians, one of them is a somewhat talented amateur and the other is a lifetime professional. How long would you need to listen to them playing to make an accurate guess about which was which? And could you make that guess before they start playing? The amateur is likely to be more nervous, and the pro has probably done this kind of audition before, which you'll definitely be able to tell. Then when they start playing, do you need to listen to every single song they can play? Do you need them to go through every single note and chord? Do you need them to list everything they've ever done? Or do you just need a few minutes of their best playing to decide and realise who is better? You see, quality is apparent, almost immediately in high-quality things, and the lack of quality is the same. This won't mean that the amateur musician isn't able to play or you aren't able to enjoy his work, but when compared directly with a high-quality example, their shortcomings become glaringly obvious. You don't need to hear everything, you just need to hear enough. Now, just like the restaurant and the musician example, games do the same. Before you get to the main part of a game, you experience a huge amount of it, from the box art, or Steam art in my case, to the quality of the game's launcher. The opening music, the graphical style, the backstory, the first hour of gameplay, you are given so many indicators of quality before you get to, as people keep saying, the good bit. And if you know what to look for, you'll be able to judge the game relatively accurately and objectively within only one hour before the good bit even happens. Now, games take a huge team of people to make, and according to a 2019 study, most gamers play a game for an average of one hour and 22 minutes. Let's round this down to an hour for simplicity's sake. This means the average game has one hour to grab a new player, to present to them what it values and believes is important. Each member of the team, from graphics to sound to art direction to physics, has 60 minutes to put its best foot forward and say to a new player, this is what you can expect from our game. Now some people say, but a game gets better, and I'm sure it does, but remember, we're looking for immediate quality. Not necessarily the best bit, but the overall quality we can expect. Game of Thrones gets better, but from episode one we know to expect high quality acting, excellent costume design and brilliant camera movement all tied together with superb writing. Final Fantasy XIV starts slow and gets better, but from the opening hour we are shown an involved plot with excellent in-game tutorial and very refined systems with a lot of attention to detail and very, very few graphical or audio oversights. Remember, I'm not saying you can experience everything a game has to offer in one hour. Many MMO games have 
thousands of hours of content, but we don't need to experience all of it to judge the quality of it. We just need to experience enough and look for the right things. The best way for me to explain now is to give you examples from real games. So far I've played 21 MMO games in my worst MMO ever series and all of them have shown me within the first hour what kind of quality I can come to expect. So if you want to judge an MMO within only one hour, here's 10 important things to look for which will help you make an informed decision. And importantly, these 10 are all objective things. There's no personal preference here, no subjective favourites. I'm only bothered about the objective analysis of the game mechanics. Number one, does it even work? Dawn of the Dragon's Ascension doesn't launch from Steam. Atom Universe doesn't have servers set up anymore. Night Online requires a Turkish mobile phone number to authorise from Steam. New Dawn has no download link and the website is forbidden. Fiesta Online's Steam launcher is now linked to offline servers. Steam is the largest PC gaming platform in the world. If you put your game on Steam, you are opening it up to millions of players. So the bare minimum you can do is make sure it actually works. If a new player downloads a Steam game, they're doing so because they don't want to deal with your proprietary launcher from your ancient website, and if the Steam launcher doesn't work, then what you are showing me is you care so little about the upkeep of your game, you can't even be bothered to have one developer check the current status of your largest potential customer base. Number two, can I change the resolution? Fiesta Online doesn't work through Steam, I had to download it from the main site, and even then, when it launches from its old launcher, it doesn't have native resolution detection and starts up far too small. Then when I did go into the settings to switch it to 1920 by 1080 it doesn't let me. Even though I clicked on 1080 it only goes to 1440. So the resolution settings in this game, a function designed to let players customise the game experience on their own machine, doesn't work. What does this say about the quality of the settings? It says player experience is secondary because a basic choice isn't working properly and no one has checked this. Number three, can I change the keybinds? WASD, the gold standard for movement in games. Now some old school players prefer arrow keys and that's fine too, but does A and D strafe left and right or does it turn me left and right? And either way, can I change it? Rebinding keys is the first thing I try and do because it's the simplest way a developer can show a player they both value their gameplay experience and want it to be customizable and they've actually programmed in the ability to do this. If a game does not let you rebind the keys, it's a sign of at best lazy and at worst incompetent developers. Now sometimes they will let you rebind but the system is kind of awkward such as not letting you bind a key over another already bound key and having the previous bind be not deletable. Requiring you to go to the old bind assign it to a new placeholder, then bind the first original key to what you wanted. This just shows that a company hasn't thoroughly tested the rebind system for each user. The key rebinding should work in a really simple way. You get a warning that the key you're trying to map is already mapped to something else and you should be able to click, I don't mind, override this. This isn't rocket science. Number four, graphical consistency and style. I do not care about how high quality your graphics are. What I'm looking for is consistency and the stylistic choices you've made and how they affect your world. The Elder Scrolls Online looks grounded and down to earth and has a consistent realistic style. Armor is well proportioned and nothing is too over the top, whereas Old School RuneScape is clunky and blocky but it hasn't tried to be anything else. It's done what it can within the limitations of the system but it's also kept its fantasy roots. You can't buy a car in old school RuneScape. You can't dress up as a character from Attack on Titan. New Frontier, however, is a hardcore Wild West survival game that allows players to build custom housing such as skyscraping condos and giant towering guild symbols. This is an example of a game designer not enforcing strict visual consistency. You have the realistic Wild West saloon town ringed by the garish over-the-top player structures. I'm not saying it's not a fun system for some people. I'm saying when a developer is so willing to let the game's artistic and visual integrity vary so wildly from the opening town, they're likely going to value people paying money to get land and build structures more than long-term sustainability of a community. This is also why Shroud of the Avatar allows garish buildings like this to exist, selling items for real money. Attractive flashy cosmetics matter more than whatever feel they were originally going for because this is a quick cash grab and not a long-term project. 
To use the over-the-top action MMO Terror as an example, while the game does look good initially, within an hour you can find the cash shop which shows you various mounts and cosmetics available which proves they are completely willing to throw visual consistency away for the sake of money. This tells me the game will value cosmetics and dress up more than it will value serious story or player journey. See that's the judgement call, Terror isn't bad, it's just a game that values looks, flashy cosmetics and big over the top fights and you can tell that within the hour. You don't need to have done every dungeon or collected every item to know very quickly Terror is going to be a game entirely about cosmetics and combat because these are the things it decides to show you quickly. It in itself is not necessarily a badly made game but it is a game that prioritises this. Oh and that car and attack on titan example I gave earlier? They're both in terror. Look at Fiesta Online, it's a cartoony anime inspired children's game and is so far the worst MMO I've played but the items on the floor when they drop from enemies don't look like the chunky blocky character models. They're not even 3D, they're 2D player facing 16 bit sprites despite this art style appearing nowhere else in the game. This stylistic call was made because it's easier and cheaper to make a 16 bit sprite than it is to make a 3D model. They are willing to ignore their own game's art style in order to save on development time and this to me comes across as lazy. Then you've got times like this in Ryzom where the graphics are clearly tied to a server location and instead of loading the graphic you just see the hyperlink instead. God who missed this? It doesn't even matter if you like, dislike or are indifferent to this art style, this is a mistake. This is a bug, a graphical objective problem and for a game this old to still have this shows that someone responsible for this game is not bothered about fixing it. This is the quality they are happy to sell you. Number 5 Sound and Audio Design Now something that's true in the entertainment industry is sound quality matters much more than visual quality. Viewers will forgive bad picture but they will not forgive bad audio. The music in any game sets the tone, it tells the player what kind of mood they should be in, it can help enhance the feelings of a zone, it can act as a dynamic and narrative cue for an event. It can be so memorable and catchy you find yourself humming it later in the day. If the audio is high quality and pleasant to listen to then fine, but that's also the bare minimum. Music being non-offensive to a player experience is the base level a player should expect. What I'm listening for is how much skill and effort has been put into the music choice. Does it match the zone? Is it memorable? How does it make me feel? Final Fantasy is known for its epic, haunting and impressive overture themes. World of Warcraft has the deep booming beat of the opening page. The Elder Scrolls Online borrows from the amazing Morrowind and Skyrim soundtracks. And the music in all of them is used to enhance the zones you are playing through and thematically fits. But when a game has either no music or music that is generic and doesn't match up with the specific area you're in, it's a sign that the designers haven't sat down and said, how can we use music to enhance this bit of the game? They've just said, buy a music pack and throw in what sounds good. Audio design in games is huge. Dead Space uses the sound of the subway to make you feel claustrophobic. SSX Tricky uses the song Tricky to highlight when you're meant to be performing tricks. But what happens when a game doesn't use the music to enhance the feeling it's going for and just throws some generic beats in the background? Well then you get this. Lazy audio design is proof the developers either don't know or don't care how to use music to enhance their game and they instead opt for forgetful, safe music. If you're interested in this and for a more in-depth analysis on how this works in popular culture, watch the expertly crafted The Marvel Symphonic Universe by Every Frame a Painting. I'll link the video below. Number 6. Voice acting. Linked to audio and music is voice acting. Now not every game needs voice acting. Voice acting is a remarkably expensive thing to add to a game so when a game includes it you immediately know the budget for that game is higher than usual and so you should expect higher quality. See that's phenomenology at work. We know voice acting is expensive and so if a game has chosen to include voice acting what they're saying is this is an area we can afford to include. This means they should definitely have covered every other aspect of the game and now have enough budget remaining to afford voice actors. 
Voice acting in games lets you know the designers care about the storytelling element because voice acting is immersive and helps players who value story feel like they are directly involved. Games like The Elder Scrolls Online, Final Fantasy XIV and RuneScape 3 all feature incredible voice acting and all the voice acted scenes really bring the player into the plot. But design isn't always as simple as that and you can also use the quality of both the recording and the acting to make a judgement call on the game very, very quickly, because League of Angels also has voice acting, and it's dire. You see, some studios will bring the actors in and record on site. Others will let the actors send voice clips from home, given they have the equipment able to do so. This means they have professional voice booths set up, not just their phone on the kitchen table. And if the home recording isn't that good, say it's echoey or grainy, and still makes it into the game, it's proof the audio designer doesn't value quality checking that much. Wizard 101 starts with a conversation between the Headmaster and the Owl Gamma, and while both actors are decent quality, the recording equipment they both used is clearly different, and different levels of background gain and ambience are heard when it switches who's talking. It's so obvious to people who recognise audio quality, and is a perfect example of a textbook oversight. I'm not saying Wizard 101 is a bad game, because that is a subjective opinion, and I happen to actually think it's quite an enjoyable experience. I am saying the voiceover recording at the start of the game uses two different quality microphones and it hasn't been balanced and this makes it jarring. But what if the quality of the recording is fine but the acting is poor? Well that's proof they either didn't hire professionals and got their mates to do it, or they really don't care, both of which are signs of poor audio design. I mean listen to these examples, here is some voice acting from RuneScape 3. I can hardly look at them, it's as if their souls can't pass on to the afterlife. It only happened after their murder. I don't think it was the killer that caused it. They just looked so tormented. Crisp, clear recording with excellent, believable acting. Now, here's League of Angels. Those that bless you, I will bless. Those that curse you, I will destroy. I will give you all that you desire. I'll stand by you when doomsday comes. If you want peace, then you must prepare for war. As long as I am here, no harm shall fall upon you. Master, is it time to feast? If you must sin, then I will seal myself with you forever. Poor microphone quality and dull, flat acting. When you know to look for this, you can tell a huge amount about what the audio designer values and how good they demand a game be. You can tell their standards of quality. Number 7. The Tutorial It is a smart business decision for every single video game to assume it's the first video game a player has ever picked up and is going to be their first experience in the world of gaming. Then they should pace and plan their game to give the player all the necessary skills to survive in their world. This is usually done with the help of a tutorial. Now if a game does have a tutorial, it should also have a skip option, because players who have already played it might not want to go through it again, and if it doesn't have a skip option, it should be possible to complete in only a few minutes, so returning players don't feel held back. So what does the tutorial do for new players? Well, it lets them see what they'll experience, what skills they'll need, and the type of gameplay they can come to expect. It is essentially a condensed down version of the best parts of your game. Remember, given the one hour nature of a gamer's average play session, a tutorial might be the only aspect of your game a new player ever experiences, so it has to be good. Games like Life is Feudal MMO, Mortal Online or New Frontier have terrible, awkward and boring tutorials, and every single fan of the game told me the same thing. The tutorial is bad, but it gets good if you play more. And while I'm sure that's true, do you know what that design says to me? It says that this company do not value the new player experience, because they don't have any intention of actually attracting new players. They are relying entirely on the current fan base to fund their game, or they've given up on growing. If a game has a tutorial that the existing player base describe as bad, then that game has no intention of surviving by attracting new players. When I play a game and the fans tell me, oh you were just in the tutorial, that's a bad bit, then I can make a very 
accurate judgement on the entire company and say they haven't even bothered to make the new player experience optimised because they're not actually expecting any new players. To confirm this theory, I called Life is Feudal MMO tutorial absolutely god-awful and unlikely to ever attract new players. People told me I was wrong and Life is Feudal is amazing and now Life is Feudal is shutting down. Number 8. Physical objects having the correct physics. Game worlds are virtual places that sometimes emulate physical consistencies. If your game is based off known physical constants and you see a wall in a game, you shouldn't be able to run through it. Some games, like Portal or Superliminal, play with physics or perception in a fun way and they break those rules on purpose, but when your game is designed to operate a certain way, such as a door being a door and a tree being a tree, you expect physical collision. Running through objects in-game is a sign of poor collision detection and, in the worst case scenarios, can lead to boundary breaking or getting outside the designed playable area. While boundary breaking can be somewhat fun for end-game players when you've got nothing better to do, it should always be an event caused by excessive player effort. It should be difficult to break the game. It should be designed so that you can't. The physics of the game should be consistent. So, when in Fiesta Online you can start the tutorial then immediately run through this wall and clip inside the house, what do you think that made me think? It made me think, wow, they've done so little quality control. They have paid so little attention to this easily accessible building that I am able to run right through the wall. And if they've not bothered to check this, which is literally the starting area, I wonder what other far more important systems they've also not checked. You do not need to have played a game for a thousand hours to know that this is not a good start. You do not need to have eaten every meal at a restaurant to know when food arrives burnt. I am not judging the movement or the art style or the personal preference. I am saying this objectively shouldn't happen. Number 9. UI quality and scaling. The user interface is how your players interact with the game and its overlaid systems. Some games, like Elder Scrolls Online, choose to have a very minimalist design. Others, like RuneScape 3, have an overwhelming amount of content showing. But what I'm looking for here is the graphical quality and consistency, the resolution and customization, and then the scaling. You might not like RuneScape 3's default overlay, but this is how much you can change. This is a menu you can access within seconds of playing. And the same goes for Final Fantasy XIV. You, as a player, have a vast amount of choice when it comes to how this game looks. The developers have spent a serious amount of time and effort making sure you can make the game look the way you want it to look. Then, along with customization, I'm looking for graphical consistency and quality. Are the edges of the boxes and menus well defined? Are they smooth? Does everything look deliberate? Or like this example, does the box just end like a badly cut image? Does the scale of the UI also natively scale to the resolution of the monitor it's being played on? Because when I played Mortal Online, it took a while for me to think maybe I should drag the chat box up because there might be more options below the screen. It took me so long to think of this because having a super long vertical selection list, so long in fact it spills off the screen, when you've still got all of this horizontal design space to work with, is a bad design decision. You have forced the player to make an unintuitive decision because you have not designed it well. Providing the player has the minimum spec hardware, then the player's hardware should be able to natively show your game well. And it's your job as a designer to optimise your detection systems to make the game look the best it can possibly be. Number 10, variations within style. The final factor I'm looking for is variation, and this is quite a subtle thing. How many different fonts are there? How many colours? How many styles? How much is going on that looks like it doesn't belong together? Like it's from another game? Now look at this. Notice how the colours are all similar, the style matches, the fonts are easier to read, and everything looks consistent. In my video on Adventure Quest Worlds, I spoke about how each overlay and each menu and each specific map and journey looks like it was designed by a different artist, because it likely was, and how very few of them have any visual consistency. Then in my Fiesta Online video, I've spoken about how the music doesn't fit any of the areas, or how in Shroud of the Avatar you go from a third-person action adventure to a board game style overworld, and you move around from there. Games will have a team of graphical designers and someone overseeing that team. And one of the elements of that oversight job is to make a game as appealing as it can be to look and listen to. 
And one of the best ways to do that is consistency. Does your UI use the same font or font family? Are the menus using the same border? Does the close button make the same sound when you click on it on every menu? Small touches that show a designer has thought about the consistent quality of the experience. In Fiesta Online, again, I'm using this as an example a lot because it's bad. When you open the map, the close button is a green square in the top right. Then when you open the daily login page, the close button is a red orb. These two are not related at all, and it just cheapens the game to not have a consistent style. Anyway, that's 10 points, so let's wrap this up. You'll notice I've not even touched on quests or the questing system or combat or classes or races or fantasy versus sci-fi or story versus raiding endgame content because those choices don't actually matter when it comes to quality. Warcraft is tab target focused on endgame raiding. Neverwinter is action combat focused on campaigns and dailies. Guild Wars 2 is both. Wizard 101 is a card game. Defiance 2050 is a first person shooter. The choice of what system to use or what to focus on as a core mechanic is developer preference and different systems will appeal to different people. You cannot say this game is bad because it uses this type of combat or this game is bad because it focuses on this specific style of gameplay. That's subjective opinion. You can however say this UI is bad because it has inconsistent art styles, fonts and is non-customizable. You can say, this soundtrack is bad because it hasn't been written for this specific area of the game. You can say, this tutorial is bad because it takes a long time to play and doesn't show the game's strengths, because that all shows a lack of effort on the developer's part. So no, you cannot experience everything an MMO has to offer within an hour. In just the same way, you can't eat every item at a restaurant, watch every episode of a TV show, or listen to every song by a band. But you don't need to do that to form an opinion if you know what to look for. You can look for build quality, visual and audio quality and consistency, the new player experience, the tutorial and its implementation, the user interface and its customization, the keybinds and your control over them, the standard optimization for hardware and the detection of your hardware when running the game, the ease of access, the voice acting. You can look at what the game values enough to be within the first hour of gameplay and then how much effort the company cares to put into that experience to understand the general quality you can expect from the game further down the line. If you play Warcraft for an hour, you won't know what an epic raid is like, but you will know the gameplay is solid, the mechanics are simple to understand, the world is graphically consistent, and the music is generally fantastic. If you play Terra for an hour, it will let you know it's a visually spectacular game with cosmetics overpowering story. Play RuneScape for an hour, you'll be aware of how it's a low requirement, grindy gameplay, click and wait game. You won't be an expert in the game, just like a restaurant critic isn't an expert in any one specific restaurant. But you will, just like the critic, be able to see the individual elements that make up the game and judge the quality of those and put together a picture of the game experience as a whole. So to those comments telling me I can't possibly judge an MMO in only a few hours, you're right insofar as I can't experience everything the game has to offer, but if you know what to look for, and where to look for it, and what to inspect, and what to critique, you can absolutely judge a game's overall quality. I very much look forward to the arguments this will cause in the comments. Cheers for watching. If you want more MMO style videos, then drop a like or sub the channel. A massive thank you to my Patreon supporters and Twitch subs who make all my videos possible. If you are enjoying my videos and would like more, you can support the Patreon from only £1 a month. Comment down below with any game you would like me to play next in the series of worst MMO ever, or a game you think is overlooked and should be reviewed. Click the videos online now to go and watch another one, or check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter, and Discord. And as always, have a great day.